Um, hi, my name is Ali Karamoseni. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our fireside chat. Um, we've been running these uh, chats along with our seminar series for um, for a while now, and they've always been very uh, educational. Today is going to be no different. Uh, we have a great speaker and um, a wonderful um, leader in, in the field. Um, so it gives me great honor to introduce uh, Jared Bailey. Jared, Jared is the Director of Science and Technology at the Center for Contemporary Sciences, which is a uh, recently um, uh, developed uh, nonprofit focusing on pushing forward some of the technologies that we're going to talk about today. Jared uh, received his PhD in genetics from Newcastle University in England and uh, subsequently sp spent a few years uh, doing research on uh, premature birth um, on human tissues. And for the past 16 years, he's worked on a number of different organizations in US and UK uh, on evaluating different um, um, human relevance of animal uh, models as well as um, uh, on areas related to biomedical research, drug discovery, and um, really whether uh, these models uh, in some way can uh, reproduce some of the complexity of human physiology. As you guys know, this is something that is uh, very close to our own interests as well um, with our um, um, research in organs on a chip. Um, so I'm very excited to have um, Jared tell us more about it. So Jared has uh, has a uh, also very um, distinguished career. Um, he has um, authored many scientific publications um, um, and also um, presented to a number of uh, very uh, recognized organizations like the um, FDA, the U.S. Congress and UK and EU parliaments um, um, regarding um, his expertise in um, animal uh, experimentation and um, their relevance in biomedical research. Um, and uh, we're very excited to have him today join us from what uh, appears to be um, uh, in UK. Uh, 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 I think maybe you may be working from home like the rest of us. Uh, but uh, with that said, what we're going to do today is, uh, Jared, um, if uh, we're, we'd love for you to kind of give us a little bit of a, um, insight uh, for a few minutes with your um, kind of uh, with a presentation. And then what I love to do is um, open up um, a very lively discussion with um, everyone. So there's a couple ways to engage with us if you, if, um, you have the uh, the interest to actually have your voice be heard by everyone uh, please raise your hand and i will unmute you so we can we can get engaged in the discussion um, uh, directly or you can always type your uh, questions or comments in the chat box or in the q a box and i will be sure to convey them so with that said jared uh, welcome and we we are very excited to hear from you Thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Please let me know if, if you can't. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the, the Terasaki Institute. Thank you to you, Ali, and to, and to Mehmet for inviting me uh, to speak today. I, I really do feel very honored uh, to have been invited. And thank you also for such a, for such a wonderful introduction. It's, it's much appreciated. Um, what I'd like to talk about today uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll try not to speak for too long, um, comes under quite a broad title of, of minimizing animal experiments. And what I'd like to do is to explain why I think uh, this, this is such an important issue, obviously, for, for animals used in science. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it's an important issue for people. And it's where I, and I think increasingly many, many others, believe that uh, science, the evidence shows that biomedical research should be heading, it should be heading in this direction. Um, I was going to say a little bit about me because I think it's, it's important to know where people are coming from, but, but Ali's already done that very, very beautifully. Um, so what I'll say is that it was during my, my seven years as a senior research associate researching premature birth in, in humans 
that I really got, uh, got a, a scientific interest in the human relevance of, of animal models, of animal research, um, because I was investigating human premature birth using human tissue and human cell culture. And um, some of my contemporaries were investigating the very same issue using animal models. And when we, we, we were uh, writing up our results, presenting at conferences, I noticed that there were real discrepancies between species. And it made me wonder why people weren't using the same methods I was using. And that really, really piqued my interest in animal uh, research generally to the point where I decided it was something I wanted to, to dedicate um, a significant part of my career to, to, to researching and writing about this, this very issue. Uh, so over the past uh, 16 years, uh, I've worked for a number of groups and organizations on both sides uh, of the Atlantic doing just this. And um, I've uh, published a lot of work in many, many different areas that I can uh, very quickly uh, summarize here. The, the uh, examples include drug testing, um, developmental toxicology, the effects of stress uh, in animals in labs, not just not just on the basis of welfare, but science in terms of the quality of data it's possible to get from animals in labs who are uh, chronically stressed. Uh, Non-human primate research, including chimpanzees, uh, fields of neuroscience, HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, cancer, the use of genetically modified or GM animals uh, generally, the technique of CRISPR itself, and if there are issues with it, and whether we should be applying that to animal models. Um, dog sentience, cognition, and emotion, because dogs are used in laboratory research, uh, and many more. <clears throat> now, it was just a few months ago that uh, a new group, the Center for Contemporary uh, Sciences, uh, the CCS, was set up following uh, a meeting of experts from various fields uh, who met in, in the Northeast of the, the USA to discuss a number of important issues. One of these was that uh, it really does seem that the appreciation of the limitations of animal models, of animal research, is probably now uh, at an unprecedented level. And certainly that's my view as someone who's been immersed in this field for the last uh, 15 to 16 years. They discussed the, uh, the premise that uh, we're, we're really seeing a, a record level of disquiet of, of animal research in scientific publications, increasingly in mainstream scientific publications, not just, just niche ones, um, about the lack of the translation of animal research to clinical benefit, something that's being voiced by scientists from many and varied uh, specialized areas of scientific research. And at the very same time, we have research methods available to us as scientists that I think it's, it's fair to say we could barely have dreamed of uh, just several years ago. Uh, methods that enable research to be conducted with a human focus from start to finish. So given this set of circumstances, why is it that the pace of change, the shift from animal models to human specific research, why is it so slow? Why does it seem to be much slower than perhaps the scientific evidence demands? Why is animal use in science actually increasing again? And why are those who are developing these amazing human specific technologies sometimes struggling for funding, certainly relatively? Why are they sometimes struggling to get their technologies into labs why is it so difficult to have their technologies accepted to the degree uh, they, they should be by the regulatory authorities? So I was uh, just a few months ago approached to become part of this new group. Uh, and uh, its uh, mission statement, its vision, is to catalyze this much needed paradigm shift from animal focused research to human focused research. Uh, and I was very thrilled to accept and become part of it because on a personal level, I was uh, increasingly of the opinion that the focus of those of us who'd been critically appraising animal-based uh, approaches to biomedical research really needed to shift from that towards showing what these human-specific technologies could actually do, what they're capable of, how science and humanity could benefit from biomedical research that was uh, in many ways fundamentally different from uh, and better 
than much uh, of what had gone before. So uh, therefore, um, it could be argued that this is, is really all about reframing the ethics. We all know very well that there's a strong and important ethical issue surrounding the use of animals in uh, particularly in invasive biomedical experiments. But what about the ethical impact of animal-centered biomedical research on humans? Is this an effective use of resources? Could the funds that support animal research be better used? Does animal research or does research that is human specific better inform human health? Because if we're not commissioning, funding and doing the very best science that we can, then this is a human ethical issue. We have to ensure that we are always doing the best we can. And we do this by critically reflecting on where we've been, on where we are and where we could and perhaps should be. So to illustrate this, um, this is a photo of my daughter, my, my only child, just after she was born two months prematurely. I've, I've already mentioned that that was a, a large part of my life, researching uh, premature birth. I'm very glad to report that she's, she's almost eight. She's coming up eight years old and she's fabulous and brilliant and funny and healthy. And you would never know that she'd been um, born so soon. Now, this is an active area of research in science because prematurity can be dangerous. It is not uncommon. It often has lifelong adverse consequences for, uh, for those who are born uh, prematurely. Yet, we still don't know what causes it, and there's still not very much at all we can do about it. And why is that? Well, for sure, it's a difficult issue, but I think difficult issues demand that we use the best tools to solve them. And I really, in many instances, don't think we are. I think too many animal models are used and there are too many species differences with those models to resolve. And I'll come back to this, but I think it's important that we need to start and end with human biology to solve human problems. So I think the evidence to support this shift is, is really uh, in kind of two areas. Uh, what is wrong with the way things have been done uh, and largely continue to be done? And what is pos possible with another better way of doing biomedical research? And the problems with the way that things have been done, I think, are evident in, in two real areas. The first is in so-called basic research. Now, many of us will know that that's research that doesn't have a specific focus, like, for example, cancer research or research into Alzheimer's. But it's research that's largely curiosity driven, that perhaps just looks into basic biology and biological functions. And an example I'd like to give here uh, is neuroscience research, how the brain and central nervous system work to process information, control movements, and, and so on and so forth. Now, this is of huge ethical concern because much of it involves highly invasive experiments on, on non-human primates. And, and actually, this is one of the major reasons why some people who oppose animal experiments or have issues with them do so, the neuroscience involving, involving monkeys. Now, a few years ago, I uh, published an extensive review of non-human primate research in basic neuroscience. And it concluded that, based on evidence in almost 200 papers uh, that I referenced, that the contribution of non-human primate research to human neuroscience had been grossly exaggerated, that the human relevance generally of non-human primate uh, research had been very much overstated, and that there was an exaggeration of how basic science data results uh, actually translate to human clinical benefits. And at the very same time, it was clearly evident that there had been an understatement of how much human research had contributed to uh, developments in neuroscience, that the consequences of species differences between non-human primates and human neuroscience had also been understated, and that there was an underappreciation of the actual degree of suffering uh, that is involved for non-human primates, primates in, in that field um, of research. Now, uh, a, a UK report from 2011, uh, an independent report that looked at the same issue, actually agreed with very much of this. 
it found, for example, in most cases, there was little direct evidence of actual medical benefit from uh, monkey-based neuroscience research, that often uh, monkey research in that field could and should have been done in humans, and many, many uh, more things. And of course, all of this impacts the very important harm-benefit analysis that could and should be done before uh, any animal research, particularly, uh, arguably, of this kind, should be approved uh, and conducted. So the second uh, major field is in uh, applied research, research into specific diseases and issues that have affect people. Uh, and there are similar failures to translate to human benefit evident here. And I think one particularly salient example is the use uh, of animals to test new drugs for human safety and efficacy. And I think it's, it's quite astonishing that there is precious little reliable published evidence to support this uh, in, in the scientific domain. Even empirically, animal testing, I think, of, of human drugs seems to be poor. Perennially, it seems that more than 90%, 90 to 92% of new drugs that appear to be safe and effective in animal trials then go on to fail in human, in clinical trials. And of the few that do reach the market, many are then uh, subsequently withdrawn or have boxed warnings applied to them, again, often due to adverse effects that weren't predicted preclinically. Now, because of the lack of published evidence, uh, several years ago, I and my co-authors did our own study to analyze publicly available data here, and, and this resulted in the publication of a series of, of four papers. And one of the salient things we found um, was this. When an animal test suggests that there may well be an absence of adverse drug reactions with a new drug, in other words, that it, it looks non-toxic, it looks potentially uh, safe. This test result adds virtually no evidential weight to the prior probability that that new drug will also be free from adverse reactions, from significant adverse reactions in people. And to illustrate, a result suggesting safety in dogs raises a prior probability of human safety from 70% given existing data, for example, in, in, in cell culture tests, in, uh, in computer-based uh, analysis of, of structure and function and so on. It raises that from 70% to just 72%. And we found that actually for non-human primates, that, that, re that elevation of probability was even lower. So these animal experiments are simply not, they're not fit for purpose. They weren't fit. Uh, they weren't worth the financial and ethical cost. Now, a couple of studies uh, subsequent to ours have shown the very same thing, and this is using industry data for their analysis. Uh, but animal testing of new drugs is still standard procedure. And there's another issue too. It's not just the fact that drugs that look uh, safe and effective in animals turn out not to be so in humans. It's the other way around. It's widely accepted that many new drugs that would have ended up being safe and effective in humans will have failed due to poor results preclinically due to adverse reactions in animal tests. So fortunately, there is now increasing pressure on many sides to change this and to move away from these unreliable animal-based preclinical tests towards something much more predictive of human response. I'd like to, to very quickly just give another couple of examples which I think illustrate this. One is stroke. Um, there has been huge promise of many uh, interventions in animal models, but no significant uh, drugs for humans. And the reason, the main reason for this really does seem to be that animal models of stroke are increasingly accepted as having poor relevance for humans. And another is HIV AIDS vaccines. Now, I uh, myself looked at this uh, in a, a paper published in 2008 and found that there had been uh, at least 85 different types of HIV AIDS vaccine that looked safe and effective in animal tests, many of them in non-human primates, uh, many in chimpanzees. These had been tested in around 200 clinical trials and none of them had proved safe and effective in humans. And I actually updated this uh, a couple, using 2018 data um, in a paper that will be published um, very soon, I think. Um, and the number of clinical trials of HIV AIDS vaccines has gone from 200 in a decade to over 760, and it will be more now 
we still don't have a safe and effective HIV AIDS vaccine. Now, it's fair to say that this failure certainly isn't all down to animal models. In part, it's certainly due to things like, for example, the fact that um, simpler cell culture methods aren't of sufficient physiological relevance, there are inadequacies in experimental design and technique, uh, and so on. But there certainly is a strong evidence base that the poor human relevance of animal models really does play a huge part in this. And that evidence tells us not just how so much research is failing, but also why it's failing. And I think this is really, really important. I think perhaps the main reason for poor translation to humans uh, is genetic differences between uh, species. Now, superficially, it seems that many species have a high degree of genetic similarity. But if you dig deeper, you find that despite this, it's gene expression, gene regulation and expression, which is where the real differences between species lie. So for example, we share many genes with non-human primates uh, in particular, and actually also with mice. But it seems that at least one third of all of our genes, this is many thousands of genes in whichever organ or tissue you look, these genes are differentially regulated and expressed. And this really does matter in terms of biochemistry and physiology, in terms of immune function, metabolism and brain function, and so on. We also know that uh, many animal models aren't good models in many cases, because the animals that are used don't get the disease that they're modeling. So they have to be modeled artificially. And I think a good example of this is, is Parkinson's research. So these models can show superficial similarities to human diseases, but they aren't sufficiently reflective of those human diseases. And we also know that the laboratory environment itself is a serious issue. And again, this is, is something I published on. I published a review uh, showing that the stress resulting from simple life in a laboratory for an animal in a laboratory, the alien environment of the laboratory, the procedures animals undergo in labs, don't just have welfare-based consequences, they have scientific consequences because those stresses change gene expression significantly and affect data derived from the research that those animals are involved in. And these changes affect the function of many physiological systems, such as the immune system, the nervous system, cardiovascular system. They affect aging and healing and many, many more things. So what, what is the solution to this, to this lack of translation, translation and to, uh, I suppose, animal models that, that, that we know why, why they're failing to translate? Well, I think it's clear that we, we really have to do something else. I think the evidence is there. You can't carry on doing the same type of thing over and over again and expecting a different result, uh, that at some point there will be a different outcome. And that is one of the major reasons why earlier this year, the Center for Contemporary Sciences, CCS, was launched. First and foremost, we are convinced that all available evidence is pointing science in one direction, as I said, towards research that starts and ends with human biology, towards research that is at all times species specific, and at all times uses models that are as predictive as possible, and models that are actually able to be significantly refined and significantly improved to be even more predictive and physiologically relevant. And of course, uh, this won't need much elaboration at all for many of you uh, watching and, and listening into this, but such methods include advanced three-dimensional cell and tissue cultures, spheroids, organoids, um, organ on a chip, human body on a chip, uh, imaging studies, biomarkers, om omics technologies, and so on and so forth. And our vision reflects this. Our vision is that quite simply, we want to save and improve lives by catalyzing the world's transition to human-specific medical research. And I think catalyze really is the operative word here because this transition is happening. It's happening anyway but we believe the pace of change needs to be much, much quicker for the benefit of absolutely everybody involved. The process needs to be catalyzed and that's really what we intend to do. So how do we hope to do this? And I'll, I'll start wrapping up now. Well, we have a number of threads to the strategic plan we devised over the last few months. Education is 
paramount, perhaps. I think um, maybe not enough people know enough about enough of this, to put it simply. So we believe there's a need to showcase what is happening in this field much more effectively to make sure that uh, bodies that award grants, medical charities, governmental and academic institutions know much, much more about the power and capability of human specific methods, how much they're improving, how urgently they're needed, how they need to be embraced more fully and more quickly. And we'll do this by connecting with them, by showcasing salient scientific breakthroughs and papers, by publishing our own work that reviews and analyzes the field. And we also want to support biotech companies, both startups and established companies, by helping them connect with end users, with potential users, with decision makers, with funders, and so on, so that they and their technologies are reaching as many people as they possibly can. Greater connection is also needed between entrepreneurs and investors, and we will seek to facilitate this. For example, with freely available databases of stakeholders, by being reactive and responding to requests for help, by mediation, and so on. And we want to improve, improve the adoption of human-specific research and testing methods. And one of the ways we plan to do this is to conduct really forward-thinking, constructive scientific workshops with the express goal of solving research issues. Experts will convene to ask, what are the most pressing questions and problems in a particular field? And how can these be solved using a suite of coordinated, complementary human-specific techniques? And we will publish our work and work with open-minded researchers that use animal models, and who might other, otherwise use animal models to find ways of solving problems that will be more likely to be successful, to translate to human benefit, as well as being quicker and cheaper, and of course, more humane. We also plan to uh, try and increase the pipeline of early career scientists, including undergraduate students, to human-specific research techniques by working with educational establishments to ensure that their students have good access to information about these techniques and how they are positively impacting science. And also to appreciate that this area of science is projected to grow hugely, in some cases exponentially in the future. This is a really good area of science to get involved in if you are an early career scientist. So I think overall, what we need to do is to inspire all stakeholders and to impart confidence in these methods in everyone who's interested in all involved parties to make all stakeholders feel good about really knowing what is happening where this field is where it's heading and that they really want to embrace it and to become part of it so thank you so much for listening i hope you've you found what i've had to say interesting uh, it goes without saying that I'd love to hear from anybody who has any questions, comments, ideas, anybody who'd like to work with us, support us, partner with us in our mission. Uh, you can get in touch with me at my email address here. Please do visit our website. It's very new, um, but uh, it will grow a lot in the near future. It already uh, will provide information about who we are, why we exist, what we'd like to do. And I now very much look forward to uh, having a little uh, discussion about more of the issues with, uh, with you, Ali, and, and with everyone. So thank you again for the opportunity and thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jared. This uh, was very, very enlightening and insightful. Um, so I do, um, uh, as I mentioned, encourage people to uh, chime in. I know there were some people's hands who were raised um, when uh, we started the conversation. I think at this point, if anyone is still want to chime in, feel free to raise your hands now. Um, and because I wasn't sure if it was uh, by mistake. <laughs> uh, but we do have some questions. And I, you know, I think it's really uh, CCS is exactly what um, in the scientific community, I think was has been missing. So I'm very excited about um, its development. Um, just out of curiosity, what are some of the ways in which you think CCS can work with an institute like us, um, Jared, and if you guys have had um, some discussions internally? 
Yeah, you know, that's, that's a, re a really good question. We've, we've spoken to, to a lot of, of really, really exciting groups and, and people in, in many, many different fields. And, and we really want to, want to work with people. Uh, I, I think, um, as I've said, what, we, what we'd like to do is to try and inspire confidence in what all of these groups such as yourselves are doing. But I think that's one thing, one thing that's not where it should be, one thing that, that really is missing. I'm not saying the confidence isn't there, but the confidence isn't, isn't really enough. Now that's not really having a, having a dig at anybody. I, I think it's human nature to, to, to fear or be at least apprehensive about, about a big change, about making a big change, about jumping in with both feet. I think it's human nature to feel comfortable with, with what we do and what we've done and the, the, you know, the work that is, is behind us. But I think we need to, we need to really convey the, the urgency that this, that, that, it, that this change is needed, that it will benefit everybody, every stakeholder. So we're, we're gonna try, as I said, education is important. We need to showcase what groups such as yourselves and others are actually doing, the, the breakthroughs you're making, really convey the promise of these technologies, not just the capabilities of where they are or where they are now, although that's important, but where they're going and, and how, they're, they're ever improving. I think I made that point earlier. These are technologies that will continue to improve and be more relevant and more predictive. And really, with, with animals, uh, with animal models, you, you hit a brick wall. There's only so much you can do. And really, really what's going on now, which I think is responsible for an upsurge in animal use, which we've seen uh, in many developed countries, certainly in North America and in Europe, is an increase in genetic modification, the belief that you can, you can genetically tweak these animal models to make them significantly better. Now, I, I really don't think there's any evidence that, that that happens. I think you just open largely another can of worms. Um, I wrote a, a book chapter recently on CRISPR and why it's an amazing technology with, with an awful lot of promise, but we should be applying it to advanced cell and tissue cultures, not humans yet, although that of course is the promise, but using it, to, using it to create GM animals in the hope that you can make those models better, I think, I think it's, it's false promise. And that has been seen from the, the degree of, of unwanted on-target and unwanted off-target effects that are associated with the technology and that are really, really persisting. They have to be ironed out before we go anywhere. But I think it's you know, we're really, we're really trying to improve when we look at animal models, models that, that really aren't very good and that can only be improved so far. And we need to inspire confidence to, for in all stakeholders to make this shift, whether they're, they're doing it, funding the research, whether it's regulators looking at changing the, the, the testing protocols. So that's, that's what we want to do. We want to find out much, much more about what, uh, what companies and institutes are doing, and we want to try and educate all the stakeholders about what's going on and why they should be embracing those and, and using them. Uh, and I think also, you know, I mentioned reaching out to early career scientists because, um, you know, my, my conversations with, with, with lay people and with early career scientists is that there, there isn't enough knowledge about this, this field of science. And I'm, I'm really surprised by that. And when you know when you start talking about that and, and, and conveying that knowledge, people are really, really excited by it. And I think you know I think if we reach out and really educate early career scientists, there'll be a whole a whole wave of scientists wanting to come into this. And you know they they will bring their their enthusiasm and their brilliance, and and they will they will impart that knowledge and educate more and give that confidence to more and more people. And it will reach a critical mass and it will take off. And that's, that's where we need to be. So, um, so yeah, we, we're, there's a lot for us to do, but, but we're, we're looking at doing an awful lot of things. <laughs> I know there's, um, there's even interest amongst our audience in uh, whether there are opportunities to work with you guys directly, either as uh, researchers or other ways. Uh, what, uh, what opportunities do you see for uh, the young scientists um, who are on this call to potentially interact with you? Yeah, well, we've, uh, that's a good question. We've, we've al we're already, um, we're already uh, with our second batch of, of interns who are doing some really nice work with us. 
Uh, we're already looking at our third, third batch of interns. Um, but what, we, what we'd like to do is to, is to facilitate it, it, you know, a connection between scientists who, uh, who are interested in this field and the, and the, um, you know, the academic uh, research establishments, the, the, the companies, the biotech companies who will be taking on those scientists. We want to link those people up so that we can act as a, as a conduit between the two to, to facilitate that. So, uh, you know, so, so that will act, for the, act as a, a benefit for the scientists themselves who are, who, are, who are wanting to find out, who are wanting to find out uh, what companies are out there and what they can do for them and for the companies and the research groups who need really good scientists coming in to, to help them. So that's, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be, we'll be trying to, uh, to put, put things out there. I mentioned the, the databases that we're, we're already um, very heavily working on that are going to be freely available so people can see what's going on. So we'll have those out there and then we will, you know, try and facilitate connections between all interested parties so that they can, they can hook up and, and help each other. So we're, we're very happy to hear from everyone and, um, and, we, and we really want to help and we'll do our best. Wonderful. So, so this is a little bit of a um, little bit different um, question, but one of the things that I've recently been fascinated by is really how much um, the livestock industry is uh, for the lack of a better word, is destroying the planet. Um, my understanding is that um, somewhere um, between 17 and 25-30% um, of the greenhouse gases are emitted by uh, livestock just uh, breeding. Um, and so, so just, um, and I know that there's models, for example, like um, as we've seen with Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat, uh, um, plant-based meat or even cell culture-based meats um, um, as alternative approaches um, on that. So, so just out of curiosity, is the CCS interested in that um, aspect of um, animal welfare um, as well? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to, to give a nod to the, the Good Food Institute, which is, is doing some fabulous, really scientific work up, up, along those lines. But I think, I think you're absolutely right. There is, there's, a, there's a really amazing uh, overlap and common interest here between, between those two areas of, of, of science, because I think what what um, you know advanced uh, cell and tissue culture and organoids and chips and so on what they are trying largely to achieve is 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 better physiological relevance and that's also what the artificial meat industry is trying to achieve because if you if you are trying to make cell cell culture based meat if you have better physiological relevance if you can mimic actual meat better then that's what that's what your customers are or potential customers are looking for they want something that that looks and smells and tastes like the real thing but that's you know that's what that's what both areas of science are trying to do so i think advances in in basic science or or even a, applied research in in the biomedical side can help the other side of things and any sort of advances that are taking place in the in the kind of cultured meat side of things can also help biomedical research. So, so I think that's a, that's a really good point. I, I think I think both camps can can really really help each other and, and benefit each other. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we have a couple questions that are somewhat interrelated, um, asking about um, public resources um, that are available for learning more about um, this area, such as preclinical pre research in um, different therapeutic areas and costs associated with it and uh, ways to try to address those, as well as a question about um, how, do we, um, um, how do we potentially work um, with CCS in trying to um, uh, kind of push forward their mission? Uh, other great questions again. Um, I, I think uh, to, to find out, um, well, there's a, there's a few, few things going on. The first thing I'd say is, I think I try to convey what I think is the importance now in, in terms of, of, of generating confidence in human specific methods is, 
is moving, the, the balance is shifting, I think, from what I've done for the past 15, 16 years, which is, which I think is important. I don't think there's enough critical reflection in science. That, that used to be the bedrock of science to, to look at where you've been and where you are and critically to try and destroy your models and your hypotheses, not to try and, and underpin them, you know, to, to fish around, to find information, to, to justify what you're doing. Um, so I, I've done that. I, I think a lot of other people increasingly over that time have done that. Uh, it's in the mainstream now. Um, ECVAM in Europe, the European Centre for the Validation of Alternative Methods, have just published their, their first in a series of, of, of papers looking at the capabilities um, of advanced um, human cell cultures in, in various areas of research. So that's, that's going to be really exciting. That's something we have planned as well, not just, not just um, researching and publishing reviews and papers in various fields, but in conducting the workshops I mentioned where experts in, the, in various types of, of advanced uh, human specific methods can get together immersively for, you know, for maybe two, possibly even three days and sit with blank sheets of paper and come out with, with research protocols that otherwise would have used animals, you know, to really say, look, have the confidence to do this. This can answer the questions you want to answer. And it can, it's not only more humane science, it's human specific, it's better, it's more relevant, more specific science. So, so uh, you know, so we're going to be involved in doing that. Um, you can look at, at, at the work that I've done over the past 15 years that really uh, aren't so much the carrot, which is, which is what, what we're doing now instead of the stick, the carrot, the, the attractions of, of all of these amazing methods, but, but the stick, why we really as a matter of urgency need to move on. We need to leave where we've been and the methods we've used behind. So, so all of that's out there and there's going to be more and more coming out. And we're certainly going to try uh, to, to put all of that information on our website to act as a resource for people who, who want to know more about it. In terms of, um, of how, you know, how, how people can work with us or you know, how, how we can help them, um, it, it's really what I found already just in a matter of weeks is that it, it's kind of on a case by case basis. Everyone is doing really unique individual things and has their own particular expertise and interest and, and wants different things. Um, so we'd be very happy to to talk to anybody to see you know where we could go from here and for, you know that that's going to not just be mutually beneficial but it's going to enable us all to to reach that vision that i spoke about where we really are catalyzing and speeding up a transition that's going to benefit absolutely everybody we we really firmly believe that so so it's it's all out there we're going to facilitate it but um please please do get in touch we'd we'd love to to you know to to speak to you all and and see where we can go from here wonderful so i'm going to also um maybe talk about another area of um of animal use which is um there hasn't been much discussion about it at least um in in terms of what I've seen. So there's a, obviously a bulk of um, animals are in the laboratories are used for pharma type applications and um, looking at um, different things, but there's also um, animal experimentation, particularly large animal experimentation for medical devices and trying to kind of see whether this type of stent works in this um, uh, type of thing or a implant of some sort. How do you think one can try to address those kinds of problems um, and try to uh, recreate models uh, that can better mimic human behavior with those uh, devices? And another great question. I think, uh, I think there's two main points I'd like to make. Um, the first is, is again, we, we have to come back to an appreciation that probably, probably an animal-based approach is not going to be a great approach. Uh, it isn't going to be sufficiently predictive of the human, the human biology, the human condition, the human response. It, it just isn't. There are reasons for that, uh, and, that and they are based in differences in gene expression which are, which are vast and that we just can't really do anything about. We just can't Im improve. So that's the first thing, that, that going down that route is, is not a great route to go down anyway. The second thing is that actually I'm, I'm 
constantly surprised at what some people are doing and you know um some people set out had set out to tackle really difficult problems and managed to do it so i spoke um with a lady at at, um, at cal poly uh, in in california recently and she is doing that very thing she is uh, she is is doing um 3d cult vascular cultures and they can they can look at at, at stents and um and, and and other associated issues um if uh, if anybody wants to know more about that that specific issue please get in touch and i'll i'll, I'll put you i'll send you some information or, or put you in touch with with this research group so it's funny that you should mention that because that is being done and there is there is an amazing uh, human specific culture-based method to do that that very very thing i think the point is you know there there is there is always a, always a way, and I think wherever people have have taken a deep breath and tried to go down the species specific route for very good reasons, it might have been hard work, but they're very glad they did. And and I think just to finish off, um, that kind of I I found the same thing in my my research into premature birth. People used to say to me, "Why are you using human tissues and human cell cultures?" Because the variability between individuals and how do you make sense of all the data and the gene expression and my response was always your your data in your sheep or monkey or mouse model might be less variable because of because of the nature of your experiments but ultimately they're on the other side of a species barrier that is very very difficult to surmount so it can be more difficult to do human research but it's entirely possible and people who do it are always glad that they they took that slightly more difficult route initially because what comes out the other side is always better better quality data better science human relevant science that is much more likely to translate to human benefit so i i think that's a very important point wonderful uh, so we have a question um, um on what do you think is the biggest obstacle in transitioning uh, from animal model research to human models? Uh, another brilliant question. <laughs> you know, that, that's a question that is, has vexed, uh, has troubled many people uh, in, in science for a long time. What, what, what is the obstacle here? Because if you look at many areas of science and engineering, uh, advances in technology are embraced and taken up and used very, very quickly. And the pace of progress is, is, is just colossal. Not so much in biomedical science. Um, and I think there are, there are reasons for this. I'd like to say first and foremost, um, this is really being addressed. It's become a very hot topic of conversation. And it's going to be the subject of a panel that I'm involved in just next week. Uh, in a, a conference in the UK of advances in cell and tissue culture. And that is the very question for, for the panel. What, what are the obstacles to this and how do we get over them? And I think, you know, what people are saying is that there isn't really a scientific obstacle. That's, that's the real irony of this. I mean, the science is, I, I think, so compelling and so wonderful that that's not the issue. But I think we have to we have to to be empathic and to and to understand why why there are issues and it is an issue of um, of, of of hubris you know people have used animal models for a long time built their careers on them in any area of human endeavor people don't like don't like to think that they might have, have been wrong or, or might might not be doing the best thing they, they possibly could I think I think there's some fear. There's some fear of uh, certain, in, certainly in terms of of uh, drug and of chemical testing. That that if you take a leap and do something else, even if it, the evidence of it being better and more predictive is it is there, when something goes wrong, and it will, because these are models we're using, then you're you're going to be subject to litigation, and you, you're gonna you're going to be in trouble, even if things go wrong much less often than they used to with the demonstrably less predictive, scientifically poorer approaches that, that were being used. So there is some fear there. And again, that, that comes back to the confidence we have to give to the people who are, who are taking this leap. So I think it's, um, you know, there, there are demonstrable things like uh, personal and institutional locking, where you just get locked into a certain way of doing things and getting out of that and getting into something else that you have to, 
really start from scratch and learn an awful lot about is a very, very difficult thing to do personally and institutionally. So we, we kind of know what those, those barriers are, what those impediments are to the change that I think we really see needs to take place. Um, but that, of course, doesn't mean they're insurmountable. What it, what it means is that, that uh, people need to get together and are getting together to talk about this, to really appreciate what the problem is and, and work out what the best thing to do about it is. And I, I think that's, that's really, really encouraging that this, happen, this is happening. And I think that sort of approach will get us closer to, to the critical mass and the confidence that we need to, to really make, make this shift. And I think just to finish, sorry if I'm talking for too long, I think just to finish, to go back to what you said before about um, you know, uh, kind of cell, cell cult you know, cultured meat uh, substitutes and so on. It, it's, the same, it's the same sort of thing. It was, it was niche and it was a real minority and it was expensive and there were so many problems, many of which people didn't think could be overcome. And then all of a sudden we reach that point. We, we get past the, the scientific barriers. People get confidence in what they're doing. People get interested in what's going on. And all of a sudden you hit that critical mass and off we go. And I, and I think if you look at what's happened in the last 12 to 18 months, it, it's been beyond anyone's wildest dreams in, in that particular area. I really believe that's going to happen in science too. And, and it can't come soon enough. And I'm, I'm really excited to be involved with so many brilliant people in, in trying to make that happen. Wonderful. Um, you know, unfortunately we have time for one probably final question, maybe two. Uh, but I was wondering about um, what are your thoughts about how regulatory agencies are going to um, try to embrace these kinds of uh, tissue models in their um, approval processes because to me that's always a challenge um, when it comes to making these things um, real world applicable yeah another good question um, you know I I used to be I, I and, and others I know used to think that this shift was really going to happen in in a regulatory arena first and then it would kind of uh, osmose if you like in, into academia and in, in, into basic and applied research um i spoke with uh with um, a guy called malcolm wilkinson uh, who, who used to be with a um a microphysiology company called kirkstall in the uk and he convinced me and i think he was right he convinced me it was going to be the other way around the, the uptake initially would be in academia. It would be in bench scientists looking, you know, as I guess you used to look on websites and through company catalogs at, at the bench, looking at new, new products and new techniques that were available and thinking, that looks fabulous, I'm gonna give that a try. It, I, I think that is what is going to happen in academia. And once you get more and more uptake, more and more data, more publications, that confidence, then it will go the other way and the, you know, the regulatory bodies will look in and see the power of these methods and gradually start to feel more confident about pulling them into to, you know, to what they look at, to what they want to see. Um, it may well be, you know, some people think it's going to happen in a, a stepwise fashion and I, I think I agree. Um, so it may well be that, that um, drug companies are encouraged to submit that sort of data uh, along with with animal data that the regulatory bodies are comfortable with and slowly that's how the confidence um, will you know will, will come through in the regulators and that's how that's how the change will happen so I think it's a it's a really interesting question and um, you know it would be really it would be really good to to talk some more about how how people think this is going to happen if if the regulators need more attention, if it is going to be in academia first, and then the, the, the confidence will switch across to the regulators. But, but either way, what we need is, is, is use, knowledge, education, uptake, confidence, and that will, that will work on in, in every way in which these technologies are used. Wonderful. Now, obviously, this is a, one of those areas that um, uh, I think it's, it's going to be super impactful. And, and that's why the Institute 
is very much interested in building these uh, personalized uh, microphysiological systems. So it's very much aligned with um, our mission. So hopefully we can make a dent um, in this problem. Um, and uh, with that said, I, you know, Jared, th thank you very much. This, this obviously was very um, amazing. And I know there's a lot of interest. Um, unfortunately, the only thing is we can't get through all the different uh, things people want to ask. But, uh, but uh, you know, this obviously won't be our last interaction. I really hope that we can interact a lot um, between CCS and the Terasaki Institute uh, going forward. And uh, thank you. And also thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you everyone for your attention and for your, your very intelligent questions. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you uh, again, Ali, for, for being such a fabulous uh, host. And uh, yeah, I, I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues too. We, we, we very much look forward to, to working with you in the future. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you everyone and stay tuned for our um, next um, and subsequent events. Super. Take care, everyone. Thank you.